Hello and welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. I'm Dr. Scott Hoy. It came to my attention a few weeks ago that Dr. Dan Brown had passed away. Dan has had a huge impact on psychology and hypnosis over the past three decades. His books include Memory, Trauma Treatment, and the Law, Attachment Disturbances in Adults, Treatment for Comprehensive Repair, and Pointing Out the Great Way, the Stages of Meditation in the Mahamudra Tradition. These titles, among others of his, are classics in psychology and Buddhist meditation traditions. They also point out Dan's immense grasp of both the Western psychological traditions, mind-body practices, and Eastern meditation. It is with this huge loss in mind that we offer this encore episode with Dan. This is from way back in 2019 when the Psychology Talk podcast went by the name The Chicago Psychology Podcast. If it's your first time listening, we hope that you will find enlightenment from this deep dive with a great thinker from the world of behavioral health and spiritual traditions. Safe and easy travels, Dan. Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, Please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Chicago Psychology Podcast. It's my pleasure and honor to be interviewing Dr. Dan Brown. Dan is the author of Attachment Disturbances in Adults, Treatment for Comprehensive Repair. He's the co-author of that book with David S. Elliott. I want to give him credit as well. And he's also the author of numerous other books, one of which has won an award, um, I believe, for forensic work with uh, hypnosis and trauma. Is that correct? It's called Memory, Trauma, Treatment, and the Law. It's about the first false memory debate, and it won seven awards. One was the Gutenberg Award from the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law and the American Psychiatric Association for the Best Forensic Work Contribution. Yes. And for those of you who are interested in those subjects, I would recommend picking it up. Um, but today, uh, Dr. Brown and I will be discussing dissociation, trauma, and attachment uh, in human beings. So maybe we can just kind of launch into that and, uh, and start the discussion. Okay. There are two things I want to start with about dissociation. The first is that dissociation is sometimes an important part of traumatization, and so sometimes it is not. And some of the best work on that was done by the neuroscientist Ruth Lanius in Ontario. And what she found was that there are two different types of traumatization. About 70% of people who are traumatized present with what she calls hyperaroused predominant PTSD. The dominant symptoms are re-experiencing symptoms, unwanted memories, unwanted flashbacks, unwanted feelings about the traumatization, and hyperarousal symptoms, high physiological arousal and response to triggers to the trauma and startle sensitivity, things like that. And the other group of people, which is about 70, about 30% of people have dissociation predominant PTSD. And what she found is the the neurocircuitry of both of those groups are quite different from each other. So, for example, in the hyper-aroused group, the main neurocircuitry of trauma is an unremitting amygdala response, which is the fear arousal center of the brain, and the failure to dampen that by the medial prefrontal cortex, which is usually associated with sense of self. So you you don't get top-down regulation over the amygdala or the fear response part of the brain. So you get unremitting fear response. The 
dissociation predominant PTSD has completely different circuits involved with it. If the main aspect of the dissociation is dissociative amnesia for the trauma, then the circuitry associated with emotional memory goes down. There are two integrated circuits involved with dissociative amnesia. One is the right temporal parietal system, which is emotional memory. So when you activate an emotional memory from long-term memory, that system gets activated and it retrieves the memory. And the other is sense of self, which is the medial prefrontal cortex. So when you have a memory, two things happen. You remember the memory of the emotional event and you can say, this happened to me. And those two circuits go back online, the medial prefrontal cortex and the right temporal parietal system. However, with somebody who has dissociated predominant PTSD and they have this strong dissociative amnesia, they either don't activate the right temporal parietal system, which means there's no emotionality to the memory. They might activate the left temporal parietal system instead, which is semantic memory. So they have an abstract idea about the memory, but no feeling about it. Or they'll activate, or they won't activate the medial prefrontal cortex, which means that they'll have the memory and they can't say it happened to me. Now, what dissociation predominant PTSD shows in terms of its neurocircuitry is something that Pierre Genet, the far, grandfather of dissociation, said 150 years ago. He said when people dissociate from a traumatic event, they make the event unreal emotionally, and they can't say that it happened to me. They distance themselves from it. So he thought the essential features of treatment were what he called personification and realization. Personification means you can say that, that, that this trauma happened to me, this event happened to me. And realization means you can bring forth the memories and all the reality of that in, into your mind. So the neurocircuitry currently, in terms of the science, has corroborated what Pierre Genet said 150 years ago about what goes offline in terms of the neurocircuitry of dissociative amnesia. One other thing I should add is that there's a fair amount of research on people who have major dissociation phenomena like DID, dissociative identity disorder. And the main neurocircuit involved in that is the medial orbital frontal cortex. The medial orbital frontal cortex is associated with three things. It assigns emotional salience to phenomena. It's the center for all the positive emotions in the brain. And it's the center for social connectivity. So when people have major dissociative amnesia, they can only remember negative traumatic memories. They have no positive experiences. They are emotionally numb. They lack the emotional salience for things. They're most emotionally numb most of the time. And they disconnect from themselves and from the rest of people, other people. So in dissociation predominant PTSD, you either get the dissociative amnesia or you get dissociated identity and both of those circuits are involved in those as I mentioned so what's what one more thing I, well, one, one more thing I want to add about this is the, the these two types is dissociation predominant PTSD and there's hyper arousal predominant PTSD and the neurocircuitry is quite different in each case and one of the studies that Ruth Lanius did was very convincing along that line is she had a, a couple that underwent a life threatening motor vehicle accident and they scanned them after the accident, and one had dissociation predominant PTSD and showed the neurocircuitry for that, and the other had hyperaroused predominant PTSD to the same event. Two different people experienced it with different neurocircuits involved. That's a pretty convincing finding, I think. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to um, ask, so uh, or kind of comment. The same circuitry is involved with people uh, basically – uh, based on how they're hardwired, so to speak, right? If uh, if they have dissociative amnesia later in life, or if it's earlier in life, I think which I think is, or is associated more with um, dissociative identity disorder, right? The proclivity for that. Still, the same circuits are involved. Still, yeah. yeah. But the difference is the uh, the etiology of DID is usually intense childhood trauma. Well, I don't agree with that. Oh, okay. I think the etiology of DID is disorganized attachment in early childhood, which disrupts all developmental lines, aggravated by childhood and later abuse, or childhood trauma, later, later, later childhood trauma. Okay. So maybe that's a good way to segue into um, 
um, attachment theory and dissociation. Well, we did an orphanage study, which I should mention along these lines. It started as a, a forensic examination for – there was a Catholic orphanage in the greater New Orleans area called Madonna Manor in the 1950s. And the brilliance of the Catholic Church was whenever a priest got accused of being a pedophile, they transferred them to all the same Catholic orphanage running running a school for, for boys and girls. And there were six pedophile priests who all ran that Madonna Manor, and they hired a pedophile staff, so you can imagine what happened to the kids. So after the media exposure in, in Boston and about a decade after that, there, some people started to remember memories of the abuse, sexual and physical abuse at this Catholic orphanage Madonna Manor about three or four decades later after it happened. And I was involved as an expert in testing. I tested about uh, 30-something of the victims, all who had recovered memories. And when I do forensic testing, I do two days of testing. Where I do a number of structured interviews, a number of paper, paper and pencil normative tests that get at certain kind of symptoms. I do psychophysiological testing. I test for response validity and malingering and all those things. And I also gave people the adult attachment interview, which is the gold standard for measuring attachment in, in adults. And what we found is that about half of that group had secure attachment on the adult attachment inventory. That meant that they grew up with big Catholic families where there were six or seven kids. The father had to often work three jobs to make enough money to raise a family that large, which meant working on risky jobs like working on the oil rigs outside of New Orleans. And oftentimes the father would get killed or physically disabled from an industrial accident and the family would break up and the kids would go to the orphanage. But they had a good secure attachment history. And then the other half of the kids were kids who were from extreme deprivation and traumatization, where there's lots of violence and alcoholism in the home. In some of the cases, the kids were foraging on the streets, collecting food because they weren't being fed at home. In some cases, uh, one case, the father was running a meth lab out of the basement. In another case, the mother was running a, a prostitution brothel in the house. So these kids were very poorly attended to, and on the adult attachment inventory, they all had disorganized attachment. So what we have here is a unique situation where we had um, 30-something now adult survivors of childhood traumatization, half of which are secure and half of which are disorganized. And we found very different presentations in each of those groups, even though they were abused by the same abusers for the same amount of time in the same way. So the variable is attachment status. Okay, which which is formed earlier on in life in uh, a secure home and a secure attachment. Correct. Two the parents, way that yeah. we study attachment in early childhood is with what's called the strange situation paradigm developed by Mary Ainsworth. You bring a child into a play group or a playroom. It's an unfamiliar environment. There are two chairs in the room and the toys on the floor. You don't give any instructions to the mother and you let the child and the mother explore the playroom for three minutes. Then a confederate to the research comes in and you see the child's reaction to the stranger and how that affects the play behavior. Then after three minutes, the, the mother is asked to leave and you see what it's like for the child to be alone with the stranger and how that affects the play behavior. Then the mother comes back and you see the reunion and the stranger leaves and you see the how that affects the play behavior when the mother's back in the room. After three more minutes, the mother is asked to leave and the child is left alone for three minutes and you see how that affects the play behavior. So you get all the possible combinations here and it, it's a test, a, a laboratory direct observation of what the grandfather of attachment, John Bowlby, says about attachment, that healthy attachment is a interplay between healthy attachment looking at the attachment figure as a secure base or a safe haven, and the more safe and secure you feel around the attachment figure, the more exploratory the play becomes. So you get more independent and more exploratory, and the play behavior gets more and more complex. So securely attached kids have a clear preference for the mother over the stranger or being alone. They... Um, can play with the toys under all the circumstances without disorganization. They can continue exploratory behavior. Um, and they make a healthy protest when the mother leaves and they, and they reunite easily and then get back to the play behavior again. Kids who grow up as we had what we call dismissing attachment, 
deactivate the attachment system. They just do the toys. They don't have any preference for the mother, the stranger, or being alone. They just play with the toys, but they often play very aggressively with the toys. Kids who have what we call anxious preoccupation have the opposite. They inhibit the exploratory system, and they get very clingy to the parent. And once the parent leaves, they get this, they get so disorganized in their play that they can't continue it. So they're always clinging, and they're kind of a... Uh, and they, and they, they, they inhibit exploratory development, which is the vehicle of self-development, because playful exploration is how we develop a strong sense of self. So kids who have anxious preoccupation have three things wrong with them. They are highly anxious most of the time, particularly in connection with other people. They uh, have inhibited self-development. They have a poor sense of self. And they get easily in a compulsive caretaking role and taking care of other people that need it at the expense of themselves. And the third group is called disorganized, and they deactivate both the attachment system and the exploratory system. And they get very disorganized in their play behavior. And what we know about the etiology of these three subtypes of insecure attachment are for dismissing attachment, the main etiological factor is repeated rejection of attachment needs on the part of the parent so that the child basically shuts down the attachment system, and disconnects. For anxious preoccupation, the main etiological factor is continuous involvement in the parent's state of mind. The parent uses the child to regulate their state of mind rather than the other way around. So the child never learns to regulate feelings. They have a weak sense of self because they never develop exploratory behavior. And they get compulsively caretaking of other people's needs at the expense of themselves. And they get very needy and clingy and dependent in relationship, over-dependent. And the third, in the third group, the disorganized attachment, the main ideological factor is that the source of attachment becomes the source of terror. So these are parents who abuse or, or incite fear in their child, and the child would normally go to somebody when they feel that afraid to the parent to soothe them and comfort them, but they can't. So the impossible dilemma for the child is the source of comfort is the source of fear. So they can never get comforted. So these attachment types are developed in the second year of life, concurrent with the development of representational thinking. So by 18 to 24 months, we develop what Bowlby called an internal working model for attachment. It becomes a template for all future connections after that. It's well in place by the 18 to 20 months of, the, of, of after life. And 75% of people who develop those attachment maps and by the second year don't change it after that. If they have an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a teacher later in childhood, they can remap and develop a positive map for attachment. We call that earned secure attachment. And that's where psychotherapy comes in. You can remap the system. But what we found was that in our orphanage study, that the ones who had this, the, the secure attachment when they were traumatized later in childhood at this orphanage physically and sexually, that they had access one circumscribed symptoms. They had Most of them had PTSD. They had depression. They had anxiety symptoms. They had somatoform symptoms and maybe a sexual desire disorder. None of them had a significant personality disorder. None of them had major dissociative disorder. And none of them had multiple addictive behaviors. But in the group that had disorganized attachment, in addition to post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, somatoform disorders, sexual desire disorder, in addition to that, all of them had either a mixed or borderline personality disorder diagnosis. All of them had DDNOS or DID, a major dissociative disorder. And most of them had multiple addictive behaviors, which suggests that the early disorganized attachment disrupts the three big developmental lines, self-development, relational development, and emotional development. And that will manifest in later childhood or early adulthood as a personality disorder. And if they get if they get traumatized later in childhood and they use dissociation as the main strategy to cope with the dissociation, they'll end up in early adulthood with a major dissociative disorder. So major dissociative disorders like DID are a, a combination of early disorganized attachment aggravated by later childhood trauma. That's what we found in the study. So it, it causes us to rethink trauma treatment because uh, 
you can't just process the traumatic memories because uh, people who have disorganized attachment, when you process the traumatic memories, they get more and more disorganized of mind. They have what we call low coherence of mind in attachment terms. So they get worse rather than better. But if you treat the disorganized attachment and they, as a result of effective treatment, get coherence of mind at a high level, then you can process the trauma in the way you process any kind of trauma with short-term cognitive behavior processing of it. And you don't have to go through all this work of working with parts. Okay. So basically you're, you're it's almost like you're reverse engineering the assumptions about – or not not maybe reverse engineering, but you're actually – going back to the early childhood interpersonal issues and that's the foundation for trauma treatment that you're presenting in the for book. that particular group yes yeah. okay for those with disorganized attachment you have to treat the disorganized attachment we have two kinds of treatment that we offer in the book one is the generic treatment which are called the three pillars of attachment treatment the first is ideal parent figures. The second is fostering a range of metacognitive skills. And the third is fostering collaborative behavior in and outside of treatment. And then we have specific treatments for each of the subtypes of insecure attachment, one for dismissing attachment, one for anxious preoccupied attachment, and one for disorganized attachment that we highly recommend. So there's both a generic treatment and a treatment specific to the subtype of attachment disorder that the person has. Maybe you can touch base on what it looks like, those uh, three pillars, uh, how you roll out the, the treatment uh, as explained in the book. Uh, the first is we have the person imagine that they grew up in a family different from the family of origin. And we have them imagine that they grew up in a family in a family where the parents were ideally matched to them in their nature and did all the right things in terms of attachment figures. We call that the ideal parent figure protocol. And the reason why we do that is because if you look at the existing attachment treatments that are out there, like the work of Jeremy Holmes or the work of Pat Sable, or the work based on Bowlby's work, uh, all of those assume that the therapists become a good attachment figure and provide a safe haven for which the patient can explore their own mind. And that assumption assumes that the a reparenting model, that the, the therapist should act like a good parenting figure. And there are two things wrong with that assumption. One is that many times the therapist can't act that way realistically. So there are a lot of therapeutic ruptures and breaches in the treatment. And second of all, it shows a misunderstanding of the fundamentals of attachment. Attachment behavior starts in the first minutes of life. But what really changes and what's significant in terms of development is the development of an internal working model or attachment representation. That takes place at about 18 months. And it's that attachment representation that has an organizing effect on all lines of development like self-development, relational development, and emotional development. So what we try to do is develop a technique by which the person can continue to repeatedly visualize uh, ideal parent figures and positively remap a stable and positive template for for attachment relationships. And after a while, after some maybe one and three years, they learn to operate out of that positive map. And whatever the dysfunctional or inconsistent maps were, they become irrelevant because there's much more to be gained out of seeing that they can operate out of that positive internal working model. Uh, and they select um, for healthy adult secure relationships. Uh, so that's the first is what we call positive remapping to ideal parent figures that they do in the hour. And then we often tape record the sessions with their mobile device and let them listen to the hour and practice it every day. Because the more time they practice it, the more they learn to develop a new internal working model, a positive, stable model more quickly. So does that, um, does that ideal uh, attachment figure become, like you're mentioning an hour, so it's not just a portion of the hour. You're giving them, you're allowing them to listen to the whole interaction between the therapist and themselves and also the ideal uh, parental imagery? Correct. They listen okay. to the whole hour, but we want them to focus on the imagery mostly. Okay. Interesting. It's, it's kind of the opposite. Many people, myself included, will um, 
record relaxation training or hypnosis, but only that portion, not the entire hour. But it seems like there's more of a focus on the interaction. And well, because when they listen to it a second or third time, they're going to develop some metacognitive insights into their own state of mind. So we want them to listen to the whole thing because that's some of the other pillars. It's like a meta psychoeducation almost. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, well, what about the second pillar? The second pillar is fostering a variety of metacognitive skills. And there are four generations of work along that line. The first was where Mary Main and Eric Hess developed an adult attachment interview. They had a scale for metacognitive abilities. It was based on simple things like appearance reality distinctions. It seemed to me that I was angry as a child, but I might not have been. It seemed to me that I was angry as a child, but my sister says that she wasn't angry at her mother at all. So we had a different view on this. So all of those mean that we're constructing a relative reality and we can appreciate that what we construct is relative. And that was the first metacognitive scale that was part of the AAI, adult attachment interview. The second was much more systematically based and it came from the Tavistock group, Peter Fronag, uh, Howard Steele, Valerie Sinison, Mary Target, and others. And they did a lot of research on what they call a general capacity for metacognition, which they call a reflective function or mentalization. And Geir Gagli from that group, and also in Budapest, did a child study showing that how do children develop a good capacity for metacognition, which means their capacity to reflect on their own state of mind and see it accurately for what it is. And he found that it, metacognition developed in children better in, in, when parents actively wondered about the child's state of mind and were systematically curious about the child's state of mind. So they always were attuned to the child's feeling state or what the child was thinking, and they wanted to know that. So the child learned to develop and internalize their own capacity to observe their own state of mind. But they also found in that group that that people who have a borderline or mixed personality disorder diagnosis on the one hand or dissociated any disorder diagnosis on the other hand are extremely low in, dis, dis, in, in metacognitive capacity. If you score metacognition on a, on a reflective function scale on a one to nine basis, most people in the general population score about 4.5. That means we're sort of mildly metacognitive. People have been in 20 years of analysis are high on the list. They get about eight and nine because they learn to a skill in observing their own state of mind very carefully. But people who have a personality disorder diagnosis, a dissociative disorder diagnosis, never learned that because they didn't grow up in a family where the parents were attuned to their own state of mind. They were, they, in fact, the parents were oblivious to that or clueless about it. So they score... Howard Steele once told me that he never found anybody at Tavistock in the dissociative disorder group or the the general psychiatric unit who had a personality or dissociative disorder diagnosis ever scoring above three on the reflective function scale. And because of that, they developed a whole treatment based on fostering metacognitive skills. There are two, there are two versions of that. One is a version that John Allen developed at Tavistock called the therapeutic stance. So you're always constantly taking the stance of wondering out loud about the patient's state of mind. And eventually they internalize that and they start observing their own state of mind better. And the other was by Tony Bateman and from the same group and he's a behaviorist. So they have a, a list of skills that you learn, metacognitive skills that you learn that all contribute to raising the general of reflective capacity and people who are poor in it. And what they, they have very impressive outcome data. They show that if in mentalization-based treatment, oh, one outcome study, if they compared randomly assigned patients to either mentalization-based treatment or to Kernbergian traditional treatment for borderlines. To, and what they found is the treatment effect size in the mentalization-based group doubled over the traditional treatments for borderlines in, in a year. And that 70% of the individuals in the mentalization based group no longer met sufficient criteria for borderline, but all of the people in the Kernbergian group still met the criteria for borderlines. So the outcome data speaks for itself that fostering metacognitive skills in one way or another, we don't know exactly how it does it, it increases the overall organization of mind or what we call coherence of mind in attachment terms. How, does a, how did their study uh, results compare to, say, uh, DBT? Well, DBT is a nice idea, but there's no study that shows that it affects the, the diagnosis. So it, it affects people, it affects the capacity to stick in treatment and affects 
uh, self-mutilization and suicidal behavior and affects drug involvement and all the ancillary things to treatment, but the patient's still a borderline. Whereas in studies, that they, there was a study comparing mentalization to DBT, and again, uh, the majority of the people in, in mentalization-based treatment no longer met the diagnosis after two years, but all of the DBT people still had the diagnosis. So the outcome data speaks for itself. It's a good treatment. It's, uh, uh, I'm surprised that it isn't used more often uh, or elements of it in the States. That's because people don't read anything outside of the U.S. I read all the, I read all of the European journals and read all of the all of the masters in the original languages like Piaget and and and, and, and Pierre Genet and people like that and and my European friends, when I teach there, tease me and say, you're not American, you read all the masters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to pull out my reading list and, and brush up on my French and German. Um, <laughs> um, so I can catch up with you. I don't know if I'll be able to. but um. So the second pillar... The second generation of that is reflective capacity, is a general capacity for metacognition. The third generation was the work of the Rome Institute of Cognitive Psychotherapy, Tony Semerari, Giovanni Liotti, and others. And they had what we might call, they call it a molar, I call it a condition-specific approach to metacognition. What they identified is that in certain diagnostic groups of patients, there are certain metacognitive skills that are deficient, and you have to target the treatment specifically to those condition-specific uh, metacognitive skills that are missing. For example, they make a distinction between metacognitive capacity and metacognitive regulation. Metacognitive capacity is the capacity to be aware of feeling states in yourself and others. Borderlines are not deficient in that. But in terms of metacognitive regulation, medic borderlines are poorly, very poor in that. So in other words, they can be aware of their own feelings, but they can't regulate them. Whereas in their study, they found that narcissists were the opposite. Narcissists are, are quite capable of regulating their own feelings, but they're not very good at recognizing the feelings in themselves and certainly not good at recognizing the feelings of anybody else. So with, along the borderline narcissist continuum, you get different metacognitive skills that are required. And they developed a third skill, which I think is more important, and it's, the, it's what they call metacognitive integration or organization. If I say to you, or, or a patient, on a 1 to 10 scale, 1 being completely disorganized and 10 being completely organized, and the other number somewhere in between, look at your state of mind right now and tell me how organized or disorganized it is. And they might say 2, or they might say 5, or they might say 8. And I can, And if I do that, three times a session and I do that for six months, it leads to overall increase in coherence of mind, a significant increase in coherence of mind. Just by observing it, it gets more organized. So that's a very important skill that we want to teach our borderline patients, for example, or our DID patients. So that's the third generation. It's, it's it targets specific metacognitive deficiencies in certain patients with certain psychiatric diagnoses. The fourth generation is the work that I've been working on and I've been influenced by the post-formal research on levels of intelligence. Piaget's model of intellectual development goes as far as adolescence with formal operational thinking. And if we think that intellectual development stops with adolescence, we're in trouble as a race. So some people have said that we need to look at and map out the stages of post-formal development beyond adolescence. And there are six stages of cognition or intellectual development beyond formal operational thinking of adolescence. And each of those six stages has specific metacognitive skills associated with it. It involves moving beyond the world of relativism, which is the reflective function scale is based on scoring relativism. But there's a, there's a unified universe where everything is interconnected beyond that, and that has profound implications for mental health. And there's larger systems of of perspectives that are beyond that and uh, we're trying to open up all those post-formal metacognitive skills most of them have to do with perspective taking and things like that because they have profound implications for mental health and the organization and coherence of mind so that's what I would say about the second pillar we introduce a variety of metacognitive skills quickly into the treatment so they can observe their own state of mind and learn to become increased careful and accurate in their observations with a variety of metacognitive skills uh, as part of the treatment. And the third pillar is what I learned from Giovanni Liotti from that Rome group, and it's called collaborative behavior. 
and he introduced me to the work of Michael Tomasello, the social anthropologist who did 10 years in a primate lab, and he found that if you look at chimpanzees and silverback gorillas, they can collaborate in collecting food, but they don't share it very much. Where humans, there's a huge leap in evolution because humans will collaborate around team projects, abstract, abstract ideas like going to the moon or we'll have put together a group in NASA and everybody will collaborate on this remarkably abstract project and it actually works. And humans have this unique capability of human collaboration. And what Tomasello found later in his work is he looked at human development, that kids who had secure attachment are inherently collaborative. They're the ones that in preschool get empathic to the kids who are having a hard time. And they'll go over them and comfort them and, and make friends with them and they'll share their toys with other kids who are lonely. But what Tomasello also found is that kids who have one version of the three types of insecure attachment take the collaborative behavior offline. So they don't collaborate in the preschool with picking up the toys and they take toys from other kids and they butt in when they're not supposed to, they don't take turns and all this kind of stuff. So they engage in all sorts of forms of nonverbal and verbal uncollaborative behavior. So that I was influenced by Leotti's work and decided that we would try and in, 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 include it in our treatment as teaching people collaborative behavior. For example, People with anxious, preoccupied attachment have notoriously bad verbal collaborative behavior. They never take turns. They talk over you. They never get a little word in edgewise for the therapist. So the therapist easily gets irritated because they never let the therapist talk. And if, they, if you're trying to talk, they'll talk over you. We're not doing the patient any favor with that. So we'll explain to them about the... They never learn collaborative verbal behavior and they were to explain to them the rules of discourse and turn, turn taking and teach them how to develop more collaborative behavior over time. I started when I was an intern some 45 years ago. I worked at McLean Hospital and working with, I did 10 years of intensive psychotherapy with schizophrenics mostly. And I remember bringing my first case to my preceptor, who was Al Stanton, one of the original class of 12 of Harry Stack Sullivan, the interpersonal psychiatrist. And he asked me what I remembered about the hour, and I said, I didn't remember much because the woman was talking mostly a word salad, and it was, they couldn't follow it at all. He said, why don't you tell her to stop and, and work in collaborative behavior? She needs to learn to work in an interpersonal world. And if you just let her go on like that, you're not doing any favors. She needs to learn to talk in a way that makes sense. It never occurred to me before. And it made a lot of sense when he said it. And that's what we're trying to do now. We're trying to take patients who are not collaborative, verbally or non-verbally. An example of non-verbal collaboration would be a dismissing patient who never makes eye contact or never looks at you and turns their head towards you when they talk. So... If we let that go on, we're not doing the patient any favor. We teach the patient how to correct all that so they live in an interpersonal world. And what, what Leotti taught me also was that the collaborative system is different from the attachment system. They're different. He called them behavioral systems using Bowlby's term. So that when a therapist gets in a therapeutic breach, if you try and be empathic with the patient, it gets worse. They get more disorganized. But he said you have to step out of the attachment system and shift to the collaborative system. And then you'll repair the breach much quicker. So if you have a patient that you've committed some empathic rupture with, and you say, I'm really sorry, or I, I really see how that hurt you, that's going to make it worse. But if you say, let's talk about it, as a, let's work together as a team here, and let's look together at what exactly happened and what, what you were triggered by what I, in terms of what I said, and let's work on it together to see if we can explain it. They get out of the big attachment system, the collaboration begins to work, the therapeutic breach is repaired, then you can go back to the empathy. It's remarkable. And so it, this is a really unified way of... of of looking at the treatment and putting a lot of diverse information together that looks at, I would almost venture, right object for the ideal parent uh, figure, right mind for the mentalizing capacities. Or, or, and, or yeah, observation of mind. Observation, yeah. like right mentalizing or right observation yeah, of mind. Mentalizing, yeah, okay. And, and right social social construct or social, in, social contracting. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. So that's a good way of describing it. Yeah. And so um, being able to not write in a judgmental, but just the one that's going to work the best, trying to find the best best fit model for treatment um, with a template that's generalized, that, but then takes into account the specifics of the individual who's in front of you, who you're helping. Yes. Yeah. And that's, what the specific deficits are, developmental deficits are. Yeah. And repairing them. Yeah. We just have been working on an outcome study on this, the first major outcome study on this. And we have tentative results that we analyzed last week. And we had people, about 20 subjects so far in three pillars treatment for one to three years, once a week or once every other week. And then we have a control group. And the control group is interesting. The control group of people who took uh, a class for a number of weeks in psychoeducation about attachment. So they know all about attachment, but they never took treatment on attachment, just psychoeducation about attachment. And most of them have also uh, one to three years of mindfulness training. And some of that is DBT-based core mindfulness where they're not only just being mindful of the state of mind, they're mindful of feeling states and regulating feeling states and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And we found that the, 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 the control group and the treatment group were not totally comparable. They weren't uniform in the sense that the people who had never been in treatment before had no metacognitive skills. So they started with a low level of metacognitive awareness. But the people in the con- con- the control group, because they had years of mindfulness meditation and core mindfulness training, they had a much more variable range of, of uh, distribution of, co- of co- cohesion of mind and uh, and reflective capacity. So we had to use non-parametric statistics. And what we found was that uh, we, we had three outcomes that we measured. One was change in attachment status. In, in the 20 subjects in the treatment group, all of them went from mostly disorganized, somewhat sometimes anxious, preoccupied, somewhat dismissing attachment, but mostly disorganized attachment, all went to secure attachment within three years. And then we found that... Uh, None of the people in the control group reached secure attachment. A lot of the people in the control group had increased uh, reflective capacity, and some of them had some partial organization of mind, somewhere in the mid-range of the organization of mind, but not in the high range we see in secure attachment. So they had showed some improvements, but not not the kind of improvements we expected in attachment status. So what it seems to suggest is that the Ideal parent figures is a necessary component to treatment to positively remap the attachment system and make a new map that they operate out of. And that uh, shifting to a larger section, uh, list of pre- metacognitive skills, particularly those that involve perspective taking and something beyond relativity where they get an overall view of the universe here, that everything is interconnected within that and they're part of that, that that makes a difference in terms of organization of mind. Well, wow, okay. Um you, you just to kind of circle back to hypnosis, which I know you, you're well trained in here, having worked with Erica Fromm and, and other people. I um, should add for the listening audience that I'm a Chicago boy. I went to the University of yeah. Chicago for graduate school and I studied with Erica Fromm and myself and Steve Kahn were her main students over the years. Yeah. I worked with her for 35 years. And when she was in her late 80s and we were still teaching around the world together, I used to tease her. I was in my 20s at the time and said, I'm getting too old to keep up with you. <laughs> she, she, I had never met her personally, but I know she was a force of nature and a very big influence on the hypnosis world and, and in the world of psychotherapy. and, and just Certainly in, in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that, that her effect has reached a lot of other people elsewhere too. But um, – just kind of circling back to the ideal parent figure, um, it really uh, dawned on me that it sounds a lot like a reattaching, a reattachment kind of hypnotic work. And um, my own, I'll put this out here, my own uh, knowledge base is very Ericksonian. So I know that Erickson had a case called The February Man, uh, where he, he, be, he himself became an attachment figure for a person he was working with. Um, that's where it all started before Bobby even. Yeah. 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 With that case. Right. Um, I possibly, yeah. I, I don't know how famous the case was when, uh, before it was published by, uh, Rossi and, and Erickson in the seventies, but, um, 
it, it certainly seems like a, a not a I don't think he was necessarily intentionally coming out of attachment theory, although my understanding is he knew that to a certain degree, having been trained analytically, uh, but not accepting it per se, <laughs> being Erickson. But other, uh, certainly, I think that he was becoming an attachment object. It's certainly a way to work, to, to look at that, that case. Um, but how did you develop this, this ideal attachment model? Uh, I know it comes out of attachment theory, but, but how did you, you come about this, this idea? Well, on, some years ago, I taught a course on attachment repair with Elgin Baker, and it was really he was the one that started this idea. He he came up with this idea of the good enough therapist and having the patient imagine interacting with the good enough therapist in positive ways to develop a new positive map for attachment. And uh, he was the first person to think about changing the representation being important as a primary focus of the treatment rather than just being a therapist as a reparenting model. And it, it spoke more clearly to the issue of what Bobby was talking about, about the importance of in developing a positive internal working model in treatment. So that I picked up on Elgin's idea and just took it from there. Okay. Uh, and, and I've heard him speak, and uh, I can definitely vouch for his brilliance as a clinician and, and, uh, and a trainer. Um, so, you, but you've done a lot of work with this by integrating so much more information, I think, um, based on European and, and other journal work and, and, and the work and attachment that's been out there. So it seems like you've had a lot of, a lot of contemplation of, of how to, how to construct this with your team. Yes. And I would say that in the early days, we used hypnosis as an induction ceremony because, well, the, the modern definition of hypnosis, for years we didn't have a good definition of hypnosis, but I think that that's resolved around looking at hypnosis in terms of a heightened state of focus, beyond ordinary focus. And the neuroscience of that is the activation of the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is the attention center of the brain. When you effortlessly focus on something and tune everything else out, you activate the ACC. So in a Stroop test, if I show you an index card and it has a the print, and the print says the word red, but the text is green in color, you do a double take. Do you focus on the text? Do you focus on the color? And, it, and that kind of task activates the ACC. So whenever we have a competing attention demand, we activate the ACC to put effort to focus on this and tune the other thing out. The ACC is underactive in children and adults who have attention deficit disorder. The ACC is active in concentration but not mindfulness meditation. The ACC is active in any hypnotic induction. And thirdly, the ACC David Spiegel found was active when athletes who spontaneously go into a peak performance state or a zone. So all of those require a heightened state of focus. And, and John Griselier did some work in London showing that if you put in controls to this, and you ask people to focus in a heightened way, if you have a control state where they just sit and let their mind wander, that's not an activation of the ACC. Or if they try and do mathematics in their head, that's not an activation of the ACC. It's a cut above. It involves intense heightened intensiveness to activate the ACC. But that's what is required in hypnosis, and that's what people who are highly hypnotizable have the skill of. They can... They can activate an extraordinary uh, focus of attention at certain times when they intend to do that. And why we introduce that in treatment is because it's easier to learn to develop an, a new internal working model for relationships if you're if you're practicing that in a not distracted state in a heightened state of focus. You just, there's not a lot of extraneous thought activity going on in your mind, so it just happens quicker. That's why we introduced hypnosis, and I, I always used hypnosis, but then I, one time, or more than once, or three or four times, I've, I was influenced by Jeff Young's work, who does work on on schemas, schema therapy in New York. I brought him up to Boston a couple of times, and he doesn't use hypnosis, he doesn't know anything about hypnosis, so when he works on his schema, he says, close your eyes, focus, and relax, and he goes right into it. And we found that for hypnotizables, we didn't need the, the formal induction ceremony, they just go right into the state anyway. So we were wasting time on the hypnotic induction ceremony. <laughs> 
and you could just go into it easily. And where you have to focus on are the people who are more distractible and giving them some way of becoming less distractible so they can do the visualization and tolerate it best. That makes sense. So sometimes we use hypnosis and sometimes we don't. Have you ever considered using more of an alert state or eyes open version of hypnosis um, at all? That's, if that's indicated, I'll do that, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, since we're kind of talking about hypnosis here, um, maybe we can kind of touch on, we touched on how you might use it and how the protocol was kind of bored out of Elgin Baker's work and, and your work with this as well alongside him and, and, and developing that for the ideal attachment figure. But um, maybe talking towards dissociation and hypnosis, the correlates, the what makes them kind of connected and, and um, maybe parsing out the dissociation aspect or element of of this of hypnosis i know there's been some some talk about what that is and and some of the theories around that well the thing that we know about is that kids who have disorganization, if you give them the Frank Putnam scale on child dissociation, if you if you have mothers or parents or teachers rate the child on dissociation, that kids who have disorganized attachment score high marks on dissociation throughout childhood and into adolescence. And that's uh, not a good thing. It's, it's Dissociation works and it doesn't work. It allows them to stay more connected to the world, but they pay the price of that by sealing off major aspects of their experience and they can't process them. So we see dissociation as a coping style as problematic. And eventually you want to co- develop a cohesion of mind and a healthy attachment representation. And once they get organized, then you can process the trauma in a way that they no longer need to dissociate from it. But the trouble is with the people who are high dissociative and they're dissociative predominant PTSD, if you process the trauma alone, they get worse. Mm-hmm. I did over 100 lawsuits for servers who were sued in the 1990s and 2000s by the false memory people for allegedly implanting false memories of treatment. And sometimes we'd have to read hundreds of crates of records. And we found that both sides were wrong. The false memory people were accusing therapists of creating false memories in the treatment. But most of the patients came to treatment. The facts said that most of the patients came to treatment already spilling over with memories. They'd already recovered the memories and the therapist was simply processing what was presented to them, but not necessarily uncovering them, except in a small number of cases. And the therapists were using phase-oriented trauma treatment. They were processing trauma treatment and the patients were getting more disorganized rather than less disorganized. They had lower coherence of mind as a result from the processing. So that what we found is that traditional phase-oriented trauma treatment doesn't work well for people who have low coherence of mind. They get less, they get more disorganized. And hence in the disorganization, parts might show up as defense mechanisms or various exactly. things. Exactly. So it goes, it goes endless. Yeah. It doesn't go anywhere. So at some point you have to f- treat the disorganized attachment and the c- the result of that is they develop a new positive representation that's stable and they have high coherence of mind. You know, so they're on a one to nine scale, the coherence of mind will be somewhere between seven and nine, which is in the secure attachment range. And once they get organized, then you can go back and revisit the trauma with short-term treatment models, process, cognitive processing models. So you don't have to do all this work with calling forth all the parts. It's it, it doesn't make it does it doesn't work usually. Okay. Or yeah, it, it it's not what's actually the, the it might not be the effective aspect of that kind of BID treatment. It's something else might be happening relationally that's under the threshold of the therapist's you know, if if someone does get better in that kind of a model, it's over time, and it's uh, because of the relationship. Uh, maybe all of these metacognitive and ideal parental uh, objects internalized, kind of unconsciously or beyond the range of both the therapists. But we can make those. We can make those models more explicit as as a treatment right. focus, right. and you get more. They can they can accomplish more in terms of metacognitive skills and a range of metacognitive skills. They can accomplish more in terms of being collaborative, and it works better that way if you target them as treatment focus. Okay. Well, curious. What is it? Does it uh, does the therapy roll out more? Does it look more like a CBT therapy? Does it look more like a relational therapy, like a psychodynamic therapy? The way it's structured. How does it look in action uh, with your team? And with people it's, it's it. all of the above. It's integrative. 
so that some of the skill base like practicing over and over again the ideal parent figures and we change the content as we go along in the treatment the book describes how we change the content over time in each of these treatments and then you know, throughout the time we're interspersing in that looking at the state of mind with a variety of metacognitive skills and we're when we see lack of collaborative behavior and evidence for that we educate the patient on how to do it differently what's the what's the reaction being from the the trauma crowd and the attachment theory crowd towards your book the reactions have been mostly favorable okay okay and I guess maybe to kind of uh, sum up here, um, is there a way for people out there besides your book, which I'll obviously have a, um, a link to in the show notes, but is there a way for people to become trained in this particular model of treatment? Uh, yes, we have a website called The Attachment Project. Mm-hmm. You can Google Attachment Project, and it has – is the paper and pencil self-report test for attachment diagnosis, but the better one is the AI with those procedures of how to get the AI administered on you, the adult attachment or inventory interview. And then on the on the website, there's a two or three day training course in attachment that people professionals can get CEUs for. Oh, okay, excellent. And then beyond that, we have different levels of treatment beyond the three day beginning training there's a a master class that we have in various sites around the world and then after that there's a master class will be uh, supervised by one of the co-authors of the book there are nine co-authors of the book it's not just myself or David Elliott there are nine Ah, co-authors they wouldn't list them all on the cover though but um, so that then then after that there's a certification process so we're working out the details of that currently because there's a lot of demand for this now are, are there any particular trainings uh, that will be available at any point in time out in the wide world? Right now it's online. Just online. Okay, so there aren't any, any actual uh, – you're talking about the master's level training. Was that uh, in person or was that online? I'm trying well? to – this at the age of 71, I'm trying to travel less, so that's why we did it online. Okay, gotcha. I'm trying to gotcha. pass on what I can do without having to travel so much because it's too much wear and tear at this age. I, um, I hear you. Okay. Well, if, is there anything else like you'd like to add? I think that kind of covers uh, what we had set out to talk about today. Thanks uh, for the clarity of your questions. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for uh, being here. I know we had some earlier technical difficulties on my end, and we had to reschedule. So I appreciate that very much, and uh, thank you for your time, and, and best of luck with all your endeavors. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know you can find us on the web all over the place? Well, maybe not all over the place, but you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, loads of places. Please look for us. And if you can, subscribe, like us, leave us a review, send us a comment, a criticism, Hey, we like to hear a lot from people. Go ahead, talk to us. That's why we're here. By the way, this is just a reminder to let you know that all of the material here is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you do need a therapist or a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati.